Hi, I'm Ulysses, and this is Music, Meaning, and Mystery Podcast. This podcast explores the mystery of music in order to valorize it. In this episode, we speak with rock musician Robin Hayes. You can find Robin's music on Spotify. I remember last time you talked about like an experience of you were preparing for a gig, but it's the rehearsal that was special because all the kids came to dance. Yes, that's right. It was, uh, it was actually a a show, a party, a day of the dead party. And uh, we were doing sound check before the party started when they were doing a party just for the kids before they sent them home so all the grown-ups could do the real day of the dead party. <laughs> uh, and we were doing sound check, yeah. And that's when uh, we were doing this kind of groovy, had a kind of rockabilly uh, swing to it or something. The kids just, they ran from what they were doing, just come up and dance and listen. And I remember thinking, oh, man, that's, that's special. There. Hmm. So why was that? So why was that more special than you know, the gig itself, which is a gig is what a musician, you know, ostensibly they all want that, but. For a few reasons for me personally, that gig was really my first ever attempt at having a band and doing a live performance. So for me, it was a cue that the universe or cosmos wants me to do it. It's like the children are, you know, I'm like the Pied Piper and they're all running and cheering. So it's like, who cares what some dude in the corner thinks when these kids love it, you know, mm-hmm. it felt organic. It felt, uh, uh, you know, grown ups. we have so many filters, you know, a, a kid hears a swingy groove. He doesn't think, ah, oh, that's too indie pop for my taste. I'm goth or vice versa. You know what I mean? They don't think like that. They don't have these filters of what you can and cannot be. It's just like, that's got a groove, especially if they're young enough. It's groovy. It's dancey. That's fun. It's a party. Let's, let's go. So in a way they may be a better barometer or thermometer for kind of natural impulses or reactions to certain, certain things. That's how I took it. At least I was like, ah, the children are dancing. It's a grand cosmic meaning that I should make rock and roll. Something, something seems to have happened in the history of how humans use music at at one point where music went from being almost exclusively a participatory endeavor Mm -hmm. to a passive project for the audience. At least if you look, I was, I was looking at videos of the sun Bushman tribes in Botswana. They are, hypothesized to be some of the oldest like non-broken human traditional Mm. modes Mm. of living and the way they use music is that the medicine man wears these um kind of like uh, shakers like percussing percussive shakers several around his ankles and so he's he's making music but the whole the way the music works is the whole community uh yeah. like kind of is around the fire and is singing clapping and they're making the music together and this this is meant to give the performer the 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 medicine man the energy to be able to heal the community so he goes around he ends up in a trance he does the mm-hmm. you know laying of hands and he, he heals everybody. So the act of using music to heal is a community effort. So when I'm seeing people in this podcast talk about the special moments they have of making connections with the audiences, I see something that's deeply fundamentally human or, or, or f- there's something fundamental about the human relationship to music. So when you're telling me that you got like a real charge out of these children spontaneously coming and participating and making yeah. a moment. Uh, I'm wondering if, if that's not like an echo of what we know to be real. Yeah, I think so. I think you, you nailed it. I think definitely it's like, uh, or something that musicians honestly kind of instinctually know. <laughs> 
mm. in a way like and it's instinctually what we all really want uh musicians i mean of course a lot of people do want fame and money and i sure wouldn't mind being able to pay for food and rent on music alone but uh yeah it's just it's uh it's you you want as a musician you want to play a song and you want to, you want people to get down or if you're sad in the song you want people to fucking cry and so there's like and like you said the shaman he does healing but the healing is it through everyone synchronizing their minds to the rhythm like i mean he gets in a trance but i guess the tribe does too in a sense and and synchronizes with them but the shaman's just kind of the the holy fool or something or good at like interpreting it or leading it or something like i mean i think in in essence that's what i want to do is good music to party to good music to you know cry to fuck to drink to me and the one dude are working on a protest song right now he wrote the lyrics but uh i'm helping him with the music and there it's just because you know it's basically to give the finger like protest but it's still like it's a vibe we're trying to, and a reaction we want to get that's kind of like, yeah, enough's enough. You mentioned uh, it would be nice to pay the rent <laughs> with music. Why is it that you think uh, it's so difficult to monetize a musical career? Well, I mean, it's, it's so, uh, I, I think it might have gotten easier, to be honest, since you know, I don't like Spotify for a lot of reasons, even though I'm on it. I, you know, it helps me, but they're basically stealing from great bands. <laughs> um, but that's a good one thing about it is they kind of brought the, uh, the levy, the playing field sort of leveled out a bit. So I think it's easier to have a, a lesser known band to make money touring than maybe before, but I think it might have to do with our weird connection with, uh, making it as like a rock and roll or hip hop star or something like that. Is it a product maybe of like capitalist America or something? I don't know. Like uh, you make it and then you're going to have gold rings and limos and chicks following you. I, don't I, know. Th I think uh, it seems that you're trying to communicate to me that it's the way that we measure monetary success that maybe needs a, an adjustment or. Yeah, sure. Sure. Right now the best musician is the richest one and that's completely weird. You know, the most famous one. It's been that way since, I guess, what is it, Sinatra, Elvis became like movie stars. Before that, it was just like, yeah, he's great at playing the banjo. Let's join him in the mountain songs or whatever. Right, right. And As that came opposed, out. Yeah, it's, it's, I understand what you mean. It's, uh, it became a way to fetishize the <sighs> musician's contribution as opposed to just knowing what the mu musician contributes to you directly or to your community. So it's became uh, like a material way of measuring the value of music. Yeah. Instead of how many children can you get dancing at the, right. at the May day festival in your local village mm -hmm. or something, but maybe it goes, maybe some somewhere inside of the collective mind, we do want to honor musicians and we think, if they're good enough, they should be praised because mm -hmm. once upon a time they were praised. Mm -hmm. The poets and the shamans were the most important in the tribe. When we value something, we have a strange way of expressing it now because, because our world incentivizes expressing the value by money. What would it look like if we lived in a world where communities in general had a healthy relationship to music's value in their communities uh, how might a musician uh, be able to eat and be you know and flourish in his life without having a million downloads or whatever it is right mm -hmm. that's a that's a good question mm. i don't know man that's a damn good question mm. Maybe there's no answer yet. No, it's it's hard for me to even uh, pic picture picture that kind of uh, situation. It's so I mean every everything has to do with uh, you know success and some sort of uh, you know career type thing. The way we were talking about it, um, I can't help but think that it sounds like some sort of trap or prison. It can feel that way. I think, yeah, for sure. But on the other hand, 
if you're if you if you don't have that high level of success um where you you're reaching an audience of a hundred million then what kind of difference are you making i mean <laughs> perhaps there's no way to make that sort of positive contribution without having that level of success maybe that's the the necessary way because it, it grants you the ability to 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 produce some some things rather than just be stuck in a, an impoverished state and have the ability to and not have the ability to, to do anything yeah i don't know why is i always uh I always tried to think that uh, if I could, if I never like made it on any sort of successful level, I could just be some sort of influence on someone who does <laughs> or, or influence on, on a community that like what he did there, that was kind of the seed for our sound or, you know what I mean? And then again, there are, there it's kind of a different subject, but there are a lot of uh, working musicians like studio musicians who aren't rolling in cash, but they're making a good living out of it. But they're more technical. They, they lay the bass like perfectly. Uh, and they have good, they know how to record with the pressure of the recording lamp in a studio, you know, can think on their feet, but they're never in the spotlight with the gold chains and the uh, diamonds and limos and everything. But there are a lot of those kind of musicians that actually make money. But I don't know if they're the, quite the same as the shaman type musician the kind of in invoker or evoker so uh, maybe that's why maybe because i'm i see myself kind of more as like the songwriter uh uh artist type thing rather than a musician so uh it could be uh could be why i kind of lost my thread there I don't know. <laughs> well it's a it's a vast topic and very difficult sure. to parse through so I think you can't help but get lost. I'm trying to write an article right now about about money, and you know, at the, any serious musician at some point is going to have to come face to face with the problem of money. Um, yeah. There's there's no getting around it. You're going to have to make money somehow. It's either you have your Joe job and you use that to fund your music, which is the 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 only formula that I was able to to crack um, mm, mm. or you have to figure out a way to monetize your music. And that mm. may mean that the kind of music you make must necessarily be money-making music. Right. And so there's constantly this relationship to money. Um, yeah. I remember in the, in the early days of, of YouTube, um, yeah. as it was like 2005, six, seven, eight, when it started to become kind of a thing that people were doing, um, there was a music scene on YouTube of people just, hey, I'm going to put my music on YouTube. Most people were just playing in their living room, maybe yeah. making little videos. And th there was a, a community that formed around this like creative energy. The creative energy was very supportive, mutually flourishing. And the tools of YouTube themselves kind of facilitated this because you could feature each other's music on your on channels and you could message peer to peer yeah. and, and it was very social that way. And sure. then this band all of a sudden came out of seemingly nowhere. They were called Pamplemousse and their style was cute cover songs with quirky editing. Yeah. And uh, they were like a very attractive couple and they just like hit, they were, the first that I that I remember that we saw getting hundreds of thousands of people listening to them, and they were eventually be able able to build an audience. They went on tours, and there was they were kind of like the talk of the town. It's like oh, they viral us. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then that guy eventually went on to form uh, the website Patreon, which is the yeah, yeah. You uh, creatives can get paid, right? Yeah, support the artists. Yeah, yeah. But in thinking back of it, I realize that all happened at the same time as our music community fell apart. We stopped keeping tabs on each other, stopped mm. uploading, and I'm wondering how much Pamplemousse showing us a possibility came with a cause. It mm. was also showing us 
that perhaps we didn't need each other in the community. Perhaps mm. we could be independent. Perhaps we could ignore each other and, and make a living and get an audience elsewhere. Yeah, sure. So there's, it's, I'm very grateful that there is a way for independent creatives to get paid, but I'm wondering, is that the cost that we have our community communities undermined? I don't know. Like, it could be, or, or maybe it's opened up for the global community instead. Cause you think along those lines, instead of trying to make a hit in your little town, like Gothenburg, Sweden, you can find an audience in China or India or, you know, mm. Canada, Australia. One thing it has done though, definitely uh, it's almost forcing people now, this whole viral phenomenon, which is kind of what we're talking about. It's forcing a lot of musicians to ignore music and think about how can we do something clowny or right. funny or like, you know, a cool video that just billions will want to watch because it's so cool. Mm. So you see, like, I see a lot of bands and musicians, like, can't we do some video that's like, and they're just trying to get, they're just trying to get hits. And yeah. it's like, uh, it can be quite tacky, I think. And a lot, of, and I found myself doing it too. How can I, can we do some sort of, weird fake mock you doc you type yeah. thing about our band you know and it's just mm. like what's the point let's just do good songs and do some good gigs kind of thing it's a uh, it's definitely it's a puzzle that I, I can't figure out because like the word sellout gets tossed around but mm -hmm. i was trying to figure out why is it that we even have like this idea of selling out and i thought maybe the audience sometimes feels betrayed when the band gets so big that each audience member becomes worth almost nothing. Because when a band is small, each individual audience member needs to be there to support the band. Otherwise, the band cannot continue. But right, yeah, the first has... fans are the best. They're the yeah. most dedicated. They yeah. they make the band, really. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. They, otherwise, like, if those 20 fans in your town don't show up, nobody shows up. But when a band gets 100 million fans, then those right. 20 fans don't need to be there. No, they're meaningless because around the globe, the same 20, 20 different people all saw at the same time or yeah. something. And I'm wondering Everyone if that's sees not, it the first yeah. Yeah, is that what it means? You sold you sold our ability to be part of this. Could be, could be. I know I uh, I mean maybe it's because I'm getting old, but you know, I uh I was more when I was younger that I thought about selling out. My my ideas about making money off of uh music and art and filmmaking, I'm not as if I'm true to what I do. Yeah and I make a million bucks doing it, yeah. I'm not going to lose any sleep. Of course, yeah. Not anymore. Maybe when I was 20, I would have thought that. So, no, nah, not as long as you're true. If you change your message to, or, and there are, like, I would never do a commercial for fucking McDonald's, mm -hmm. you know, slaughtering rainforests, you know. there's But there are good companies that I, I wouldn't mind if they used it in a commercial. Mm -hmm. I don't think, like you know, Seattle grunge bands anymore in that sense that anything corporate is evil and wrong. Mm -hmm. I don't think like that, but my dream would be to make money if I could off of say a song got bought by a Hollywood film, a good film, a wonderful film mm -hmm. with a beautiful message. My song fits right in and it does affect lives and, uh, and I get a damn good paycheck because it's within that. Mm -hmm. That would be perfect. And that's doable nowadays. It's doable to get songs sold to cool projects and whatnot. So maybe that's how we got to think is just, you know, be picky about where you make your money. I don't know. It's hard. Beggars can't be choosers kind of thing, you know, and I yeah. wouldn't put it past somebody selling a song to McDonald's if they could pay rent, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I definitely wouldn't begrudge them the, the same uh, mm -hmm. I guess because I'm writing a book about it, and right I, I kind of have to figure out what we're all what we all mean when we talk about these things, right? Uh, well, we want to be real. I mean, we want to be like liked for our our lyrics and our our idiosyncratic choice of chord changes. 
we that's why we want people to listen and buy the songs mm-hmm. in essence i think we want the children of the world to dance or whatever going to shift gears here to something maybe that's possible to figure out <laughs> <laughs> you talked to me about a songwriting technique that you use and it seems to be it seems to be a thing for musicians which is um repetitive usage of chord progressions or a melodic phrase that then kind of leads you to something else so it kind of like entering a trance like condition and then that kind of opens up to where your song wants to go. And I think you even did one that was based on a, on some sort of mantra. Well, uh, that song was just based on the, uh, I was trying to connect with the uh, energies of Ganesha. And one of the uh, first mantras you learn is, would be uh, Om Gam Ganapataye Namaha. And I did that chant and that mantra but i did it in this kind of blue grassy open d tuning so it got this real drony effect and you know i don't even know if i pronounce it right or nothing but i just did this kind of jam on it why i got into that i don't know if you asked why we were just kind of discussing but i think i started playing music way later than a lot of my friends and a lot of my contemporaries like uh i was quite old when i started to try like I got some interesting songs I want to try to make. So maybe the main reason why I got into what you're kind of referring to is this loop kind of trance repetition groove kind of thing. Drone. It could be called drone music. Might've been in the beginning because I just couldn't do complex chord changes. or So I would just end up being on one chord, but would just try to find this little hook or rhythm in it and just repeat it and repeat it. I still love just doing that. For me, I, when I started to get in the really taking music writing and creating seriously, I was kind of steeped in, at that time, minimal like techno, like German techno was very big in Sweden at that time. And that just was all about minimalism and rhythm and just repetition of this kind of like to the point where you almost go insane uh, listening to it live because it's so minimal and so little is happening on such subtle levels that you, you, you trance out. And I started to get in the forms of organic music that were based like that, thought like that, like kraut rock, drone, raga, dub, early dub music, very simple, but has this laid back or introverted groove to it. I love it. I think it. Ha- I think it, there's something old school, like ancient ancestral, about the the simple droney groove. Just a few tones, and you just repeat it over and over. And I got really into Afrobeat, Nigerian juju music, and Afrobeat, where it can be very uh, simple little riffs, but repeated for like 20 minutes with all the instruments going in different directions in the same groove. So it's like simple, but not as simple as you think. <laughs> That way of approaching things, it's just, uh, for me, it's just, it's magic, man. It's witchcraft, it's voodoo, hoodoo, fucking cosmic shit. The repetition, just like techno, I think that's why people love techno and house music. It gets really shit on by a lot of organic musicians, just like a lot of organic musicians get shit on by techno enthusiasts. They're like, why are we watching some ego on the stage, you know? But uh, there's something about the repetitive pattern of house music, psychedelic trance and minimal German techno, this klitsch. There's something about it. I think that's almost tribal. That's why people f- love it. So I don't know if I'm on subject. <laughs> We're always on subject on this yeah. podcast. Oh, cool, cool. So connecting with the energy of Ganesha, mm-hmm. that mantra has a, has a purpose it's meant to to have a certain effect. Mm. So in writing that song with the mantra at its root of the writing process, did you notice if the performance, the recording, the publishing of this song manifested in reality in a way that would indicate that the mantra was successful? Yeah. I think so. I uh, uh, originally started connecting with uh, Ganesha. Well, he pops up everywhere. 
Uh, so maybe that's, you know, doing yoga or something. I saw him and, but I was, I was looking for, uh, energies to help me with music connect and break through and open doors. And, uh, that, you know, mantra specifically has to do with the lowest chakra and removing obstacles. So I was doing it to remove musical obstacles, insecurities and, uh, inhibitions and whatnot. He's a dancing God. So there he's often seen at rave parties and everything. There's something very, uh, he's considered the initiator also. So he's kind of the door opener to Tantra and, and the higher realms, even though the, uh, I think the, there's a goddess that's the true initiator. He's kind of like the fool that we have in like Tarot as far as kind of leads into the, the realm of the arcana or whatever. Um, but he's a dancing god and a, kind of a clowny, happy one. But he's also a slayer of obstacles. So I was at, specifically going after, I was like, that's great. Uh, I'll see if I can connect with those energies. Uh, maybe it'll help me have more confidence and, uh, and slay some of my, uh, my musical obstacles, basically. At the same time, I want people to dance. I want people to like groove on what I'm doing. So it was that, those energy I was, I was looking to connect to when I, when I did that. And uh, yeah, I uh, was doing that mantra to warm up regularly and it, it really helped me get into uh, uh, the right headspace to record uh, a few songs in a studio with other musicians, which is now on Spotify, uh, and to just get in the right. So before we even recorded the songs every day, I would, uh, you know, in the studio, light some incense and do that little jam or prayer or whatever uh, before we got going just to get in the state of mind. And I think it helped a lot. Then I, I did record that song, a little video of it, but uh, it got a lot of hits. <laughs> Back to that bullshit. <laughs> got a lot of hits uh, when I had it there. One of the most hits I've ever gotten. So if that's something that does with if that has to do with the magic of the mantra, I don't know. Is that something you tried just for the one song or is it something that you're looking to make into sort of like a musical practice? Yeah. Yeah. I try to do that regularly and I want to incorporate new gods and new energies. That was the first time I specifically connected with an entity though. I have uh, done invocations to pan before gigs and before jams uh, pan, Sure, in the nature spirit sense, but also in the uh, kind of, uh, I guess you would say it, Crowleyan or Philemic, that uh, Pan is is the god of everything. The, the Pan actually in ancient Greek means all. Mm. So it is. And uh, if, if he is the god of nature, what is not nature? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I have worked with Pan uh, a little bit. But even before I did the Ganesha one and knew about connecting and evoking through mantra and whatnot, I would try to use the grooves to get into states of minds, specifically using repetitive grooves to get into a certain trance, uh, especially live to try. And mostly it was just try to get people hooked and grooving in, mm -hmm. in sync and want to dance and not just stand and stare and chew the back and spit and watch the gig going. I don't know. <laughs> Where does uh, music come from? Shit, like originally or for me? or I mean, originally, I wonder if it was... It's a damn good question, the chicken before the egg or whatever. Uh, if we, some pe A lot of people, I think, think it came us just trying to copy nature. Mm. But it was probably because of the joy or immense sorrow. My uh, Labrador is dead now, rest in peace. But uh, the uh, that dog, whenever I played the harmonica, would run into the room and sit next to me and howl like <laughs> it was feeling my sorrow of blues. Uh -huh. And sometimes I swear that dog was in key. Huh. <laughs> I swear. And that was that's like, if that's not like shamanistic or uh exactly what we're talking about that the, like it could hear the sorrow so i wonder if some immense sorrow wasn't the the cause of the original need to just sing out mm. uh or immense joy or some sort of 
just that words and nothing else could really help with the feeling. Right. So music is a, a, a form of communication that becomes necessary when all other forms fail. Well, you know, you, you can say things without words and they'll, they can hit people. You can invoke sensations and sadness without lyrics, you know? Lyrics sometimes help, sure, but it's the melodies and everything can really evoke all kinds of things. Hmm. So I, and I think the original shamans, yeah, they were using the drums and the, and the shakers and uh, simple melodies to really get into a, uh, a state of mind. The music was uh, used as a doorway. It's so, it's so inherently linked to shamanism and magic that hmm. it, you can't really, I don't think, separate the seed like they must come from the same thing. Yeah, I've become increasingly convinced of this. Yeah. Um, but I don't know, you know, that this definitely has something to do with the fact that um, shamanism is so closely tied into a human beings early, earliest history. Mm -hmm. right? So it's going to have, it's going to be the womb of just about everything else in, in a way, right? Okay, are you ready for the uh, traditional closing question? Oh, shit, final question. Wait, let me get... Yeah, okay, ready. <laughs> what should people listen to? Truly, I wish people would just stop listening to what's kind of like in or trendy. I mean, once in a while, some of those songs are all right. I really wish people would show more interest in finding new things. You know, nerd out a bit. I mean... SoundCloud has connected the world. There's such good music coming from completely unknown musicians. Great shit of every genre. I think we should just be listening to more and more of it. I do think Western civilization should listen to the more drony, minimalistic, groovy, monotonous sounds of like, you know, what they call... Afrocentric or like you know like Nigerian Afrobeat or Juju music like open open up to that way of music everything in Western is about changes it's the, the chords got to always change and go to a climax like Stairway to Heaven and it's got to be classically perfect and and sacrificing sometimes just basic grooviness just swing it so I prefer. People let go of the Apollonesian a little bit, not fully, not to diss Apollo, but and embrace more of the pan Dionysian uh, music where it's more about feeling than technical know how necessary, more about a groove than how many chords or tones you can fit in in a half a minute. So if I had to be dictator of the world of music, <laughs> that would be the new rule. <laughs> People should listen to new grooves. Yeah, open their horizon, man. Listen to shit that you wouldn't think. I mean, there are certain genres I don't like, but I do know that there's probably one artist in the world who does that genre of music brilliantly, and I'll like their, you know, take on it. Mm -hmm. There, there is. There's just so much music out there. It's fucking amazing. There is a lot of music. <laughs> <laughs> It's like you said, it's not only uh, inherently linked with uh, shamanism, it's inherently linked with humanity and being alive and being an animal or whatever the space monkey animal type thing we are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right on, man. Well, thanks, uh, Robin. I really appreciate having this chat with you. You too, and man. Thank you for having me. Robin really got me thinking about the story of the Pied Piper. It's the story of a town who is experiencing an infestation of rats. So there is a lot of fear of the plague going about. And an announcement is made where a reward will be given to whoever can solve this problem. A musician just happened to be passing through, dressed in strange clothing, playing the flute. And he offers to make an attempt to help. He plays a tune which ensorcels all the rats, and he leads all the rats out to a river and drowns them. While the town is quite happy to have had this problem solved, however, they refuse to pay him. 
because really all he did was pipe a tune. The piper's not too impressed, so he decides to exact a revenge and plays another tune, ensorcelling the children of the town. He leads them into a mountain, which closes behind them, and the children are lost forever. There's a few lessons that I take away from this. First is that music has a healing effect, and can be salutary. Of course, there's the lesson that the residents of this town learned, which is that not acknowledging the true power of music and not valuing it has a significantly higher cost than a bag of gold. In this case, the cost was an entire generation lost. A friend recently shared uh, some Michael Jackson lyrics with me, and I feel it's appropriate to quote them here. It goes... And whomsoever shall be found, without the soul for getting down, must stand and face the hounds of hell, and rot inside a corpse's shell. So here's my wish for you this month, that you are indeed found with a soul for getting down.